Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. Um, a very distinct pleasure. And uh, this could never have occurred without the vision, the foresight, the constant support of an outstanding university college administrator. And that's President Richard Grassi, who we will shortly introduce. It couldn't have occurred without the support of former Governor Carey and the entire Carey family, uh, which now numbers about 12. And uh, we're very proud of the association of the Wagner College UL Carey Center for Government Reform. Uh, there are a couple of people I would just like to uh, uh, introduce, mention their presence. We're delighted to have the, uh, uh, the presence of the District Attorney of Richmond County, Dan Donovan. <laughs> and the former Borough President of Staten Island, the Honorable Ralph Lambert here. And if a 90-year-old man should walk in with a cane, I will introduce Governor Ucari. <laughs> but he'll be here at the next lecture, and not this lecture. Um, we're very proud of the support we've had from this college in developing the Cary Center. There's only one like it, but it's somewhat different and that exists in a little known town until yesterday, known as Albany, <laughs> and it's a small university known as the State University of New York, the Nelson Rockefeller Institute. Uh, many of us have felt that uh, Governor Carey was one of, uh, that Governor Carey was one of New York's great governors in the 20th century and has not been recognized. And the Carey Center and Wagner College will make sure that future generations will recognize his greatness. And uh, I also, in his uh, absence, only because he's in Florida, want to acknowledge, acknowledge the generosity of the Honorable Jerome Berg, who made our first year possible and is helping in the second year as well. Having said that, uh, before introducing our guest speaker, who did arrive from Albany a little bit early yesterday, and we're delighted that he's here, I want to introduce our distinguished president, whom students and faculty and administrators are very lucky to have as a leader uh, in this college and the statewide university community of private colleges. My good friend, Richard Grassi. Thank you, Seymour. The driving force behind the Cary Center is Seymour Lachman, and we should really acknowledge his work. He's been vigilant in his efforts to reform state government, uh, to open up uh, the books, to open up the hallways of power and access, uh, and to ensure the fact that democracy really does have a home in New York State. So I think we should give him a round of applause. <laughs> the Cary Center is a nonpartisan effort on behalf of Wagner College. We have all parties represented in terms of speakers and points of view and ideological points of view. We take no position, per se, in terms of a perspective with regard to reform, but we endorse good ideas where we find them left, right, and center. And uh, that's important, uh, that this organization, this center remain nonpartisan that way. A home, if you will, for, for good ideas, for good people who are concerned about the kind of arterial sclerosis that occurs uh, in uh, Albany and other capitals, uh, uh, state capitals in the country. And this is the first state that we're looking at, but the center will also begin to branch out over the years and look at other states in terms of their uh, state governance systems. Uh, so I, I say that with some affection because as a political scientist myself, I think that state governments have come back in in the last 15 or 20 years into the fold of important, really <coughs> critical uh, arteries of political decision making and the distribution of resources that affect so many of our citizens in so many ways. The center is nonpartisan. Uh, it's dedicated <coughs> to real, genuine, 
uh, articulate uh, government reform proposals, wants to, wants to uh, give them a place to shine and to be seen and understood and interrogated. Uh, and also, and most importantly, I think it's an idea center. It's a place where we think can be an incubator for good ideas around government reform. Uh, our speaker today, who will be introduced in a, se in a second, E.J. McMahon, comes from much work on the area of government reform. Uh, he is one of the great uh, speakers in this area and researchers in this area. He's been associated with, among the other things, the Manhattan Institute, which has been the seat of many of the ideas which laid the uh, foundation for successful reform in New York City. So I'm going to turn this back to Seymour to <coughs> properly introduce E.J., but I want to thank you for all for being here. I want to thank Seymour again for all his good work. I want to thank Sue Rosenberg for lots and lots of support. Let me tell you, none of us would be here if it wasn't for Sue Rosenberg. And uh, I think in many ways that um, uh, the college can make an effort with regard to distinguishing itself, with regard to public service, in addition to all the hours that students put into the Staten Island community, the Manhattan community, and other areas, both abroad and domestically, in terms of a commitment to public service, is in the area of, of formal government. And we thought long and hard about whether or not we wanted to have the Wagner poll, like other schools have, or this or that. But we thought that given our values as an institution founded around public service, way back in 1883 in Rochester, New York, that this kind of effort to really address issues of governmental, of access to power, of, of the efficiency of government, the responsiveness of government, and the democratic character of government is really what we're about as an institution. And we thought this is the best place for us to make a contribution in this area. So thank you all, and thank you so much. Thank you, President Karasi, for those very kind and thoughtful words, and for all the support that you've given us in the past and present and future. Uh, and Karen is here, uh, Mrs. Karasi, with the President to uh, partake of this um, lecture discussion, because we're dividing this half for the person who's going to speak and half for your questions which will follow. So it will be a give and take. And uh, we're all very fortunate in having uh, Edmund J. McMahon here with us tonight. Uh, I've only known him for, oh, I would say eight years since he uh, became affiliated with the Manhattan Institute. Uh, and even before he became the director of the Empire Center for New York State Policy, which he directs out of Albany, and uh, also frequently visits the Manhattan Institute in uh, New York City. Uh, he has a very long and distinguished career. Uh, for the last uh, 30 years, he's been involved in trying to reform the democratic process and the government of, of New York State. And uh, you might have read articles that he's written for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, uh, Barron's, the public interest. And the question is, how does this man come to this? Well, before affiliating with the Manhattan Institute, E.J., uh, Ed McMahon, was uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Tax Policy analysis and counselor to the Commissioner of the State Department of Taxation and Finance. As he was a policy analyst and uh, a policy maker. He was Vice Chancellor, believe it or not, Vice Chancellor for External Affairs, External Relations at the State University of New York. And he reminded me this morning that was the first time that we met. Uh, and uh, he is a graduate of Villanova, but he said that uh, if he had known in upstate New York that Wagner existed in Staten Island, <laughs> he would, of course, come to Wagner College. <laughs> and let me introduce to uh, you a very distinguished public official who has just walked in, uh, our councilman, the Honorable Mike McMahon. Uh, what? The good McMahon. The good <laughs> Very good, Mike. Um, at this point, the less said by me is best said. 
because we're going to learn a great deal tonight uh, from our speaker dealing with a see-through budget for the Empire State, promoting responsibility through transparency, and I think we're going to learn even more than that. And I know we will not be disappointed. And remember, this will be a dialogue for everyone in this room with Mr. McMahon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a good friend and one of the outstanding public servants and movers in the area of public policy and reform, in the area of budget process, but even beyond that. Mr. Edmund J. McMahon. Thank you very much. Um, President Jirasi, uh, Professor Lackman, D.A. Donovan, Council Mc Councilman McMahon above all. Where is he? There he is. He'll be sorry that I mentioned this to you, but we are not in fact related, <laughs> except in the sense that all McMahons are related ultimately. <laughs> um, other distinguished faculty and students of Wagner College, thank you for this opportunity. I'm, I'm, Despite the fact that my tenure as Vice Chancellor at the State University was, was so brief and so memorable that Seymour didn't rem even remember it until I reminded him of it, I am honored to be here at Wagner, which is also the alma mater of my former boss, Assembly Minority Leader Clarence Rapp Rappelier, um, who you ought to bring here sometime, who is a marvelous person. Uh, but indeed, I'm especially honored to be on here under the auspices of the UL Carey Center, because uh, for any student of New York State's political and economic history, as, as Seymour observed, one of the more gratifying developments of the past 10 to 15 years has been the growing consensus across partisan lines. I'd probably be placed on the right by most people. That you, Leo Carey, deserves to be recognized as one of the great governors in New York State's history. And if there's one word that sums up Governor Carey at his best, it was leadership. And I'm thinking in particular of the kind of leadership we observed during and after the fiscal crisis of the mid-1970s, which could easily have sunk the two New York's city and state, but did not because of his leadership. And we saw that kind of leadership on display again in the fall of 2005. It's a terrible thing to be old and have a vision that's neither here nor there, by the way, <laughs> some people may. Um, when Governor Carey emerged from retirement to play a very visible role in the campaign against the statewide proposition known as Proposal 1, which was the so-called quote-unquote reform amendment from the legislature to the state constitution that would basically have gutted key provisions of New York State's executive budget law. At a conference sponsored by the Manhattan Institute, the former governor warned that the amendment would deprive future governors of the power he had had and the leverage he had had to deal with the fiscal crisis. And he, he concluded very memorably, he said, for God's sake, if you love New York, don't let Prop 1 become law. And I think many people were inspired by his speech at that gathering, and it galvanized a, a campaign almost completely unfunded but nonetheless affected. The voters listened, and they rejected that prop proposition by a very large margin. Now, from the standpoint of reform, which I know is the focus of this center, that proposal represented the worst of all worlds. It would have significantly strengthened the legislature at the expense of the governor without improving transparency or accountability. Um, this is, of course, an interesting subject that's been made more interesting in a different way than we could have predicted 28 hours ago. The context of this talk has picked up some different overtones, I guess. Yet, in, in, even with all that's gone on uh, in Albany and down here, you have to keep in mind that state government and its work must and, and will go on. In fact, the state fiscal year hasn't changed and can't be changed, and the New York State fiscal year untypically begins April 1st, just three weeks from now. And so they've got to work toward that deadline, although not necessarily hit it in negotiation, negotiating a budget. So with the briefest of pauses, perhaps, the final stage of New York State's budget negotiations are about to unfold. The Assembly and the Senate already have prepared their own one-house versions, as they're known, of the appropriations and revenue bills. The legislative conference committees are soon going to convene to resolve their differences, or to put it more accurately, they will convene so their members can make speeches while the leaders of the legislatures and their staffs haggle behind closed doors to determine what it is they're going to agree on. Then, ultimately, they're going to have to go in and try to broker their differences or have them brokered by whoever is occupying the governor's office. 
um, whose identity I don't think is too difficult to guess, at least starting in the next few hours or days. Now, last year's budget process, unfortunately, took us into depressingly familiar territory. At a crucial stage, less than two weeks before the end of the fiscal year, right around now, in fact, <coughs> Governor Spitzer declared that a good budget was more important than an on-time budget. This was a very encouraging development for, in truth, the budget deadline that you hear so much about does not really matter very much to very many people. Unfortunately, a week or so later, the governor changed his mind and decided that an on-time budget was what mattered most to him. And so, in the final week of March, there was a mad rush to seal the three-way deal and to vote on bills before midnight on March 31st, which was a Saturday. So the Senate and the Assembly and their overworked staffs many of whom are friends of mine, got to spend the waning hours of the month voting on bills whose most important details were, in many respects, as usual, unclear. So much for everything changing from day one. This year's budget will be negotiated in a more worrisome fiscal and economic climate. You know, while the headlines were dominated by other events yesterday, behind the headlines, the, the stock market indexes were headed to their lowest point in two years. Now, today they bounced back up again, but at the same time, one of the lead stories in the Wall Street Journal was about the pending layoffs of probably thousands and thousands of very well-paid investment bankers on Wall Street. That really hits the state revenues, aside from the human and economic costs, because the state and the city are both extremely dependent on uh, high-income people and revenues generated at the margin by bonuses of investment bankers. So this is a symptom of the problems the state's going to face. So the stakes of this year's budget process, the impact on our ability to weather economic conditions ahead, are particularly high. And unfortunately, the less transparent the process is, the less you can hold anyone involved accountable <coughs> for whatever results are produced by what's, what, what's done over the next few weeks. But the secrecy surrounding the end of the budget making process is only part of the problem I want to address today. In fact, the opacity of the budget process is actually the least of the problem. Too much information about the spending of taxpayer money by every level of government in the Empire State is now needlessly obscured from us all year round, and it doesn't need to be. And so at the risk of, of disappointing or at least confusing you based on the announcement or description of my talk, and even worse, at the risk of disappointing Seymour Lachman, <laughs> I will not focus on how to improve the budget process the budget process being a fairly dry subject anyway, and I, I suggest would put you all to sleep. Uh, instead, I'd like to focus on a much more comprehensive transparency goal, and that is the ongoing public disclosure of all state and local government financial activities. And what I'm talking about is posting on the internet all expenditures, all contracts, and all grants and loans made with our money, and updating it on a frequent, regular basis. This is something, by the way, that has, is, enjoys very extensive support across ideological lines across the country. If you look on the internet, you'll Google these names, you'll find a letter written to all 50 governors last year by none other than Grover Norquist, who was the nation's probably leading conservative anti-tax activist, and Ralph Nader, urging the governors to do the sort of thing I'm talking about. Now, until relatively recently, the kind of transparency I've just referred to would have been unthinkable. Not Many people in this room perhaps don't remember the error I'm going to describe, but others do. Even if the state of New York had been willing, in effect, to share its checkbook register with anyone who asked to see it, you'd need your own multi-million dollar mainframe to read the computer tapes and a team of programmers to reformat them first for you. Or, in the alternative, if you couldn't afford that, you'd need a warehouse in which to store the piles and piles of continuous feed Z-fold computer paper on which they would print out what you asked for. Then you'd need years to leaf through the pages and see if you could spot what you were looking for. But the power of the internet and desktop computer technology now found in most households and virtually every public library has effectively eliminated the excuse for governments to maintain any wall between citizens and detailed information on the spending of their tax dollars. Around the country, elected officials of every political stripe are beginning to tear down these walls. A major breakthrough in this area came last year when President Bush signed the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, sponsored by the Republican Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma and Democratic Senator Barack Obama of Illinois. The law creates a Google-like search engine and a database tracking some $1 trillion in federal grants, contracts, earmarks, and loans. 
The website is up and running. It's federalspending.gov. That's federalspending.gov. You can go there and noodle around in it. You can search for spending by area. You can search for spending by congressional district. You can search for a particular vendor. It's quite neat. This is only $1 trillion is only a part, albeit a very large part, of the federal budget. And it excludes individual payments, people like Social Security recipients, obviously. The, the interesting thing is the, 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 uh, the government did this in a smart, cost-efficient way because for just a few hundred thousand dollars, they actually bought the software to program the site from a nonprofit group known as OMB Watch, which had developed it and had developed its own good version of such a website. So this is a model for the type of thing that can be done. Inspired by the Coburn-Obama bill, and in some cases anticipating it, we see a growing number of states going further. There's about a dozen states in which there are executive orders or legislation pending that would uh, bring about the type of thing I've just been describing. And uh, in addition, I think the states of Alaska, Texas, Kansas, Missouri, and Minnesota, actually Minnesota's mm -hmm. still legislation, so scratch that, have done the most to share information on state expenditures and contracts over the internet. For clarity and ease of use, my favorites are Missouri and Kansas. And uh, you may want to take note of their addresses in case you want to check this out. Kansas is www.kansas.gov forward slash CanView. That's CanView starting with a K. Missouri is, <coughs> skip the W's, mapyourtaxes.mo.gov. Missouri is really nifty. They have the whole state payroll online. And you can look at it three different ways and see who's there and what they make or what they made last week. Now, in New York, of course, the most significant step forward for transparency has been Attorney General Cuomo's Project Sunlight, a searchable public database of political contributors, lobbyists, and government contractors, or government grantees, that is. When Blair Horner of the Attorney General's office spoke here last fall about Project Sunlight, he focused on the tracking of campaign contributions and lobbying expenditures. But Pro Project Sunlight also provides an informative glimpse into one small, previously dark corner of the state expenditure universe. And I'm referring to legislative member items, which are New York's version of the pork barrel expenditures known in Congress as earmarks, and which now total nearly $200 million a year. Thanks to Project Sunlight, you can search member items by reference to recipients, to sponsoring legislators, or to counties where the money's being spent. You could also easily jump to information on file with the Attorney General's office for charitable and nonprofit groups receiving state funds. Why is that useful? Well, you may or may not be shocked to hear this, but sometimes there are ties between <laughs> the directors of charitable institutions and the politicians steering funds to them. Sometimes those ties can even be uncomfortably close. The disclosure of more information on federal earmarks, in fact, led to, I believe, the indictment and conviction of one congressman, if not a couple, because of such these times kinds of close ties. And who knows about these ties better than the people who live in the community? I can sit in Albany and browse through this list forever, but I don't know if this guy <coughs> is connected to that guy. But people in the community do know. And so this is valuable information to have out there. And there's good news on this. Project, Project Sunlight uh, allows you to do the type of searching I described. And this is a really significant achievement for which the Attorney General deserves a lot of credit. And I, among others, have given it to him. But it's just a start. The good news is that our state controller, Thomas DiNapoli, has indicated that he too is committed to sharing more financial in information with taxpayers. I know his staff is working on some version of this um, that was not specified in a speech he gave on the subject. His involvement is especially important because the controller in New York maintains the state government's accounts and pays all its bills and has to approve of all its contracts. So he sits on a treasure trove and in fact at the state level only at least, he could virtually unilaterally uh, carry out uh, the fuller disclosure that is necessary. Although ideally we'd have legislation requiring this. The goal here is not simply transparency for its own sake. Universal web-based disclosure of expenditure details can have practical added value as a deterrent to would-be ripoff artists in and out of government. Like the mid-level state bureaucrat who was charged last year with misdirecting funds to pay for a lavish lifestyle that included a fleet of vintage Corvettes. He was steering money to non-existing corporations and contractors. Now there's at least a chance, uh, there's plenty of gadflies around, that somebody would be looking at the contractors of that agency and wondering what is the XYZ Corporation? Because what happened was, I think somebody in that office finally wondered what is this company? 
But it hadn't been, you know, the auditor can't, they don't constantly audit in real time state agencies. They can't. Um, but you'd be more self-conscious about trying something like that if you knew it was out on display to the whole world. Um, web posting of contracts and expenditures would transform New York's taxpayers into a mass army of auditors, including hundreds of smaller platoons at the local level. In fact, at the local level, it would probably be most valuable because of the familiarity factor. It's unlikely that school officials, for example, in Roslyn, Long Island, which as you may have heard, where you, as you may have heard, they embezzled $11 million over a period of a few years, $11 million from a single school district. They would not have been as reckless in what they did if they knew their extravagant expenditures for gas credit cards, Home Depot, travel agencies, had all been regularly exposed to local residents who are concerned about their property tax bill. There's not a school district in New York State that doesn't have three, four, or more gadfly retired public accountants sitting around with nothing better to do than to look at how they're spending money, which is not that that's not a good thing to do. An Effective Accountability and Transparency Act in New York would create a searchable internet database of all groups getting funds from state <coughs> agencies and public authorities, including the purpose of each grant and the name of the sponsoring taxpayers. Taxpayers could also download a complete list of government contracts linked to copies of the contracts themselves, including collective bargaining agreements with unions, which are interesting reading in many cases as well. The state controller would be required to develop a system for quarterly or more frequent online posting of all expenditures on an agency by agency basis, including the legislature and the judiciary. And when I say all expenditures, I mean all, right down to items like the new carpet in the mayor's office. And I should add, in the legislature's defense, thanks to Senator Bruno, starting in 1995, the legislature publishes twice a year all of its expenditures. The one area of state government on which the most detailed information about expenditures down to the smallest level is available is, believe it or not, from the state legislature, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's only in print form in a pair of books this thick each, in very small print. Um, if you want to see it, if you go to my website, empirecenter.org, search for legislature, you'll find them, but the download takes four or five or six chunks because they're massive files. And they're not searchable. They're PDFs that are programmed not to be searchable. <coughs> However, it's a start. Um, most importantly, though, these requirements should not be limited to state government. They should be extended to every level of local government, county, cities, villages, towns, school districts, and special districts. The biggest of them, like the city of New York, could be the first to start. The city has a much more transparent financial management and budgeting system than the state of New York does, and actually would be well positioned to do this first. Fortunately, and thanks in part to Governor Carey, New York has a strong foundation on which to build here in the form of our Freedom of Information Act, known as FOIL, which was signed into law 31 years ago. The FOIL law creates the presumption of public access that's the prerequisite for true transparency in government. New York's FOIL statute is a model for other jurisdictions, and this is due to, in no small measure to the fact that when it was created, the law also established an oversight agency known as the Committee on, Local, on Open Government. Even better, the committee's been headed for most of its existence by the same exec exceptionally able, honest, and effective public servant, who is the aptly named Robert Freeman. In case you don't know them, that's a great name for a guy who's in charge of open government, and he's a great guy. Building on this example, once a solid transparency and accountability law is enacted in New York, we should probably also establish an oversight agency to provide assistance and to monitor compliance with the law. Is all this level of transparency a hopeless reformer's dream? Not at all. Under the circumstances, particularly the most recent circumstances, there are grounds for optimism that such a law could make it through the Albany sausage machine. Consider, for example, what's been happening in the last few years in the area of member items. Up until the mid-1990s, these expenditures could be tracked as line items added to the governor's budget by the legislature. You could look in the budget, and it wasn't easily searchable. In fact, this was the pre-personal computer days. But you could leaf through and find the item where, where the legislator was steering funds for Little League uniforms to somebody in Saybrook. You didn't know which legislator was doing it, although you could guess, and you didn't know how many uniforms they were buying, but you knew that it was there. Now, what happened, unfortunately, due to the increasing tension between the governor and the legislative leaders in the mid-90s is basically the line items disappeared and were replaced by a big fat lump sum. 
of between 100 and 200 million dollars, where the, which was to be divvied up uh, pursuant to a private memorandum of understanding or MOU between the governor's budget director and the legislative leaders. So as a result, for a few years, comprehensive information on member items simply wasn't available to the public. Then, in 2006, both the Albany Times Union and my organization, the Empire Center, obtained copies of the memorandum from the Budget Division through the FOIL process. We posted three years' worth of lists, basically something like 14,000 member items, prominently on our website, and we were deluged with thousands of hits from across the state. Calls for more disclosure were picking up steam around the state. A few weeks later, in April 2006, Governor Pataki vetoed the member items for fiscal 2006-07, along with billions of dollars in other spending additions by the Senate and the Assembly. The legislative leaders then got ready to counter him with a quick veto override in each house. Then something unusual, maybe even unprecedented, happened. One of the legislative minority leaders announced he would withhold the votes necessary to override Pataki's vetoes until there had been full disclosure of the member item details. This essentially forced Senator Bruno and Speaker Silver of the Assembly to agree that more details of discretionary member item funding would, in the future at least, be routinely disclosed prior to the approval of the budget. The minority leader who brokered that agreement was someone whose name will soon be familiar to more of you. Can anybody guess who that was? <laughs> David Patterson. So, it's too early to predict how the next governor will approach the pressing and complex budget issues he inherits. But Mr. Patterson's record indicates that he's a friend of transparency and accountability in government. And so in this area, at least, there's hope for further improvement and reform. Now, I know, I, I hope I've been able to provide some thought-provoking ideas that will inspire plenty of question, questions. I want the students in the room to know that I'm going to dispense with the quiz on the periodic table afterwards. So <laughs> you can stop looking at it. And uh, at, I think I'll stop right now and, and then begin taking questions on whatever basis you, you want, Seymour. 